What's up, everybody? Welcome to another Persons of Presence podcast. My name is TC, and I had the opportunity to interview the wonderful Derek Carpenter, an artist based out of Denver, Colorado. Derek Carpenter is an inspiring person and truly a person of presence. His presence is subtle yet powerful, and his art transcends time, space, and our current limited three-dimensional spatial awareness. So sit back, buckle up, and get ready to listen to us talk. It's a pleasure to have you have you here. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Um, and so I know we talked a little bit about your journey to become an artist, and um, I hope you could share a little bit about more more of that, because you haven't always been painting and and doing all that. So how did how did art start for you? Mm-hmm. Um, it started out as a kid. I would do some doodles. I just really en- enjoyed drawing things, and I got a lot of encouragement and uh, praise at that time, and and uh, that kind of stuck with me when I was younger. And uh, it turned out that I spent, looking back, I think I realized that I spent a fair amount of my life trying to replicate that feeling of like doing something that people loved and enjoyed. It made me feel good to. You know, that's something that could come from my beingness that people loved. Yeah. Yeah, and so uh, I spent many years just doodling and drawing for fun. And I also just love the creative process. Yeah. And um, it evolved a lot over time. Uh, I would just draw in high school and then um, I kind of always had this narrative in my mind that oh, I want to be an artist one day. And for some reason it was always put off. And I think a lot of that was just out of necessity. Um, I would be very busy with the things I was doing or I'd have a lot of things being asked of me. Yeah. Yeah, and um, another thing that tends to happen is uh, just encouragement. I could use a positive word or or a negative word, you know, pressure or encouragement from uh, the people close to us in our lives that kind of have ideas about where we should go. Yeah. So you continued doodling and but was, so your medium was what, pencil and and paper? Yeah, notebook paper, eight and a half by 11 computer paper. And you told me at one point (laughs) um, you tried to paint. Right. Mm-hmm. You tried to do the. When did you try to paint? When was the first time you used paint? Or there were a number of times okay. through life where I tried to paint and I never liked it because it was. I was used to um, pencil, which is very two dimensional, you know. But w- when I would get paint out, it was gloppy and it had a thickness to it. Yeah. And I couldn't control it. And if I tried to paint the second layer on top of the first, there would be bumps there that made the second layer I couldn't paint a straight line like I could with a pencil and I really didn't like it <laughs> most of the times that I tried yeah so what changed I mean so you had these doodles and you tried to to paint with 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 paint and mm. um, so how did how did you how were you able to to develop that skill um, there was kind of an interesting middle ground <clears throat> which I didn't realize at the time that this was uh, a transitional phase, but I uh, spent some time doing works with colored pencil. And that has still had the quality of uh, working with something that was flat and didn't have a texture or uh, liquidness to it. And uh, it was also very convenient to be able to grab whichever color you like. And that kind of opened up a space of being able to practice um, transitioning through color gradients and also exploring color theory comfortably because before with doodling it was all line work you know with a pencil or a pen it's pretty much black and white and so um, there was this two or three year period of colored pencil work that really opened things up which and prepared my mind for painting practices yeah was now you showed me an awesome and i'd love to I'll probably edit this into the podcast so people can see that 
um, printed um, uh, work that you did with colored pencil with there's like an eye and then a bunch of sort of fractal patterns going across that well, that was was that later in your colored pencil uh, phase yeah I think that was the third one maybe that was the third one uh-huh third out of four or five and then you said someone asked you to, to paint something big yeah right? it was actually um, the, the signal to paint came from outside it wasn't my idea somebody a friend in the art community named Andrew Norris uh, he said I'd love to see you do a big painting of something like that and I just tried it for fun and uh, haven't gone back, <laughs> haven't gone back. <laughs> yeah so you'd say that those the skills of colored pencil uh, practicing colored pencil helped you prepare for for those larger larger painting yeah in a lot of ways yeah mm -hmm. and so we talked a little bit about your process um, and in, and here's a I'm sure we'll, you'll see on the screen right now uh, some examples of some of your large paintings mm -hmm. and and sort of the process uh, when I first saw the painting I just wondered how does how does anyone come up with this like I wondered do you see this in your brain or does it just sort of come out organically so could you explain your process and sort of how that works when you're doing one of these sort of grand psychedelic abstract paintings mm -hmm. there are some very um, fundamental and basic concepts that have kind of stuck with me that um, are kind of deterministic in the way that they happen. Um, for the most part, I would say that they're spontaneous compositions. Uh, there are things that I feel looking at an image can make it feel composed, uh, like it makes a full and complete statement. And uh, Like the final product. Yeah, right. yeah. Things like having, for example, if the outer edge of a painting is dark and the and the rest inside is light, then it's kind of framed. Or sometimes you can have something that's like a central focal focal point that's surrounded by a scene. And I don't know what it is about these concepts. And there are many more than the two I just mentioned, but some things just help an an image look like a full composition. And uh, so very often when people ask me like is there a, an intention in the beginning or how do you how does it get to what it becomes it's hard to say um, but I do uh, there's a lot of using geometry and shapes and kind of feeling out the spatial uh, placement of shapes and uh, just going through it spontaneously so what do you start with? You start with... Very often it starts with some uh, straight lines and geometry. Um, I'll share a video with you of... A, I made a video out of images taken of a painting okay. throughout its process. Okay. And so there are many steps along the way and it can kind of... It reveals a lot of the process. Um, this might sound like cheating uh, but I honestly just kind of fall back on geometry a lot because um, putting some really basic shapes on the canvas in the beginning is a good way to get like a basis of like the form and the composition and then from there um, most of the process is just kind of like this playful like filling it in yeah so what is some of the geometry that you're putting circles polygons I really love uh, circles because they're easy to do with a string or a compass. Okay. And then I also love um, hexagonal geometry because it can uh, imply a lot of shape and depth. Um, back in engineering, that we would do isometric drawings. So you do and isometric you, paper? Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've draw, drawn on that where you've got like a vertical and then two 60 degree intersecting lines to sort of draw 3D cubes or whatever it is, right? Yeah. 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 It's a lot of fun. And then another thing uh, geometrically is um, perspective points. And I really love those quite a lot. And all you need is a ruler or you can, if you look, kind of put your eye close to the canvas and look along the line along the surface of the canvas, you can kind of eyeball perspective points. But um, those are really great because uh, with straight lines, it can 
nothing but straight lines it can imply a lot of depth and you can have like a center and like rays radiating out from it that kind of give it a sense of three-dimensionality so that's yeah. what all the lines sort of converge onto one point that could theoretically be like the perspective off on the horizon yeah right. okay mm -hmm. okay so you, you mentioned engineering so you didn't on this journey of yours, you were an engineer for a certain amount of time, right? Yeah. Yeah. Can yeah. you tell us about that? Um, I think I kind of alluded to this earlier on um, in the conversation, but life, uh, you know, life is very full and there are so many directions to go in and I always wanted to be an artist and there was a lot of um, encouragement in my life to go into uh, math and science because I did well in those subjects in school mm -hmm. and my family wanted the best for me in terms of what they think is best and so um, I was encouraged to go to college and engineering was the most appropriate one um, because mechanical engineers I had heard were the jack-of-all-trades and it was easy to find work and they can work with any outfit and uh, yeah, so I went out to uh, Missouri to study and after four and a half years had a bachelor's in mechanical engineering and then uh, came back to Colorado where I'd lived most of my life and uh, started working at CU Boulder in a research lab with civil engineers. Where'd you get your undergrad? There's a place called Missouri S&T. Okay which uh, it used to be called the School of Mines. Mm. Yeah. They have that out here too, don't they? Yes. Okay. And that's mines like mining yes. the resources underground or whatever? That Correct. That type, type of mine. Yeah. Um, and so how did you find, what brought you to Boulder? I mean... Um, I love Boulder. Yeah. Seeing the flat irons. Okay. Uh, they're just majestic. Mm. And also Colorado. I have a particular fondness for because um, in my experiences of traveling I've found that people in this area uh, tend to be a little more open-minded I've seen a lot more uh, well let's say it this way I've seen a lot less resistance or um, condemnation of alternative lifestyles and uh, I also feel that things are pretty progressive and evolutionary here in a lot of the ways that I appreciate like people care about recycling and they uh, they like to do healthy activities you know and care about the outdoors and stuff like yeah. that so I really love Colorado and I, I came back as fast as I could <laughs> yeah I have had the same experience in my last year of traveling um, I haven't been everywhere I've I visited California you know if a year or two ago and have a feel for that um, and I was in Oregon as well recently and I know Oregon's another sort of more progressive place in the United States but of all the places I've been nothing has pulled me or felt like home in the same kind of way that you're saying like as, as Colorado has is with the open-mindedness and the I like the way less resistance I think that's that's a good way to put it more than anything um, so I'm kind of curious, more curious about your story and filling in the gaps here between, because right now you're living in this awesome van. Mm -hmm. um, and I know van life can be sort of romanticized and I live in a van too and it's great, but it's obviously, it's not the same as some people might under, uh, not understand it. It's not as secure as living in a, as a, in a house or whatnot, but you did have this security mm -hmm. from your engineering job, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that provided some, some level of security. So how do you find yourself, if you could maybe paint some more of the steps that it, that it goes from um, being an engineer, full, were you full-time yes. when you were doing that? So being a full-time engineer to now being this sort of hippie artist who lives in a van and does art now. Like how do you, how do you get from, from, from A to B? So um, this actually, that question reminds me of a, very deep topic which kind of begs me to take a step back Please. Um, throughout this process of being an artist I have met so many like thousands of people out in like performance environments um, and I've met so many people that want something like that and they uh, they might like be freedom? 
they want to be able to they they have an art form and they want to be able to do it exclusively okay and uh so they want to <clears throat> express this creativity yeah and it could be anything i've you know there are dancers and painters and so many people who have a passion that have approached me and they see me performing or something and they they would like to know how do i get there yeah and uh it's it's been a really interesting reflecting time because uh i have been in that exact position you know having loved my doodles and that feeling of uh, making something that is appreciated but also you have a job and you need to make money and pay rent and all these responsibilities that we have that we think we need to do or should do or have to do mm -hmm. depending on our situation right yeah and so uh I was that same person on many occasions I'd go to the art walk and just be totally um, intoxicated with what I saw and uh, you know just knowing that the love that I had for art and that process I would ask people how do you do this where'd you get here like how'd you get here and um, so after some time practicing people were asking me that question and it kind of reminded me of my I wanted to give them a the best answer that I could and honestly I feel a lot of uh, compassion and empathy for that question because I think in life it's very common for people to want to do something that they love and enjoy and I also think that it's very common for us to have a need to do things that we don't enjoy and so there's this kind of threshold of how am I spending my time and uh, it's just very relatable because this existence, I don't think that it would be realistic for everybody to just do what they, what's pleasant all the time, you know? If I, if I kind of touted the ide ideology of like, everyone should leave their job and be an artist, you know? <laughs> then I, if I went to Chipotle, I wouldn't be able to get a burrito because no one would be working. Yeah. And uh, so that's been a having those conversations and being on both sides for so long and having worked and loving art so much has given me lots of time to reflect on that question and like I've also heard that something like 5% of artists make enough from their art to sustain themselves and so the vast majority of artists are doing some amount of work you know side hustles yeah. to keep it going uh -huh. so are you 100% on your art do you have any side hustles I do some side hustles okay yeah what are some of your side hustles? Um, so I was a carpenter for five years and I still have a lot of contacts with that that call me from time to time. And I've just been so blessed that the universe, uh, whenever I need a little more money or something, like someone needs something done and it's just been working really great. And is that, would you say more fulfilling for you working with carpentry and wood than doing an engineering job? Um, I won't speak too much on that because the answer is so complicated. Um, I, I do enjoy carpentry very much. There were some things about the engineering world that were kind of difficult and it might have just been specific to the place that I was at. There was a lot of kind of bureaucratic social stuff that stressed me out and so I didn't appreciate that as much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you, would, the majority of your income though is coming from selling your art or from selling your pieces or how does... I would say that it's about half and half right now. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. And how did you get, um, did, did the dance collective, did they reach out to you or did you reach out to them? Because that's where I saw your work and you have some awesome, amazing pieces in there and many, I don't know, how many pieces are in there? Four or five or? Yeah, I think there are four right now and I've got probably a total of 11 completed. Okay. Yeah. And uh, I just met Ariana, one of the owners out and about at an art show yeah okay. and they had just gotten started and okay. she said that they were going to do a gallery show and it's been like a flourishing path ever since then they uh, done the mural and shown lots of art and really enjoyed a lot of community being in that place yeah it's yeah. a very awesome community and i'm fortunate enough to have met you there um so i know we've we've uh, in our earlier conversations we touched on the environment and mm -hmm sort of even in this conversation we're talking about Colorado being out here people care more about themselves and I think people in Colorado tend to have a, a greater appreciation for the environment um, and even in the car on the way over here we were talking about one of my I, I really liked 
when we were talking about raising the collective consciousness or raising the frequency mm -hmm. of the collective consciousness, um, you sort of touched on a point that I think is worth mentioning that um, what, what is it to you? That What is raising the consciousness to you? What does that mean, if you can reiterate yeah. that? Um, I really appreciate that question because um, I think that there are there really are ways to work on our beingness that will make us make life easier and happier and make it better to get along. And uh, I also think that there are kind of perils to and like spiritual traps when it comes to um, qualifying things as con being conscious or not. I've heard sometimes I've been at a festival and I've heard people say like, oh, well, this is a con we're going to go do this conscious thing. And um, I think it's really easy to just kind of tag that adjective onto whatever we like yeah. for ourselves. And there's a free, chance. vegan, organic, conscious. Right, that makes it conscious, right? Yeah. And there, there's a subtle truth um, to be known, which is that everything is consciousness. And so um, I think there's a little bit of a spiritual trap in kind of using that word conscious as a qualifier for whatever we're interested in personally. Yeah. Or we have a personal emotional attachment to. Yeah. And... Um, so that's why I appreciate this question, um, and I've had a little time to think about what is it, what do I want to mean when I say conscious, and what, what kind of vibe do I want to put out by using that word, and I, um, if I had to define it, I would say that it's uh, being able to step outside of our own personal wants and desires, and to have a mind that can stand for the goodwill and the benefit of a, something greater than ourselves personally. And this is kind of, this happens naturally uh, in the spiritual path because um, in the process of realizing who we are, it's very often that we, we realize that uh, personal acquisition and just getting things for ourselves isn't really that fulfilling. Like, you know, we could get the house and the car and the, the experience and you know, then it just lasts a moment, and then what's next? What else can I do to fulfill myself in the world? Yeah. And uh, it's also a truth, you know, that we, there's something inside of all of us that's the same, which is that consciousness. And so we can actually embrace a deeper layer of identity by shedding our, not necessarily shedding completely, because it's right. part of functioning, but um, by kind of, taking a step back from being so intensely personally driven and uh, standing for something bigger. And I would say that that's conscious. I, I would also say that it's, it's possible to have a lot of stuff in our minds that is controlling us because we've either been conditioned or, or we aren't paying attention to kind of the, the, the havoc that we can create in our own minds by uh, having a lot of desires and attachments. And it's totally possible to be, <clears throat> to have a lot of actions and expressions that are subconsciously governed. And so um, another, what I feel, good definition of the word conscious is to know oneself so that the things that, uh, the motivations and the energies that come up and form our actions and our expressions are understood. You know, we aren't just like, donkeys you know like being driven by a mean donkey driver yeah that is carried on a stick or yeah we need like you said more possessions or more food or more whatever it is that we're consuming or we think we need to consume or it's it's very definitely a, a, a messy world out there and i'm glad to see that there are people out there and, and even sort of on my journey i've, I've felt um, a new sense of hope when I'm out here in a place like Colorado and Denver and I can talk to people about these sort of things and and not feel like I'm because it's it, it, you almost have to have an experience I think to to understand these sort of things it's like it, it's like a profound insight I think thinking about unity and connection with one and we can say all these things like choose choose love over choosing fear it sounds great but what is it like you know collect raising your own consciousness like what does that really mean and, and we can sort of define it I think it comes from sort of an experience based um, phenomena to understand that um, just to sort of to touch on that I think 
when you I, I really love that definition that you have that it's like thinking about the greater picture than yourself right that's if I had to sum it up like that's that's what collective consciousness is is understanding that we are a collective and I've pondered the meaning of life what is like what is the meaning of life it's like pretty basic but ancient metaphysical philosophical question and and we can look at ourselves and it's maybe difficult to understand what is the meaning of my life as TC or as a human being but if we look at the world around us it seems like the meaning of life is to raise the frequency of what's possible with life I mean, we, if I look around, we couldn't exist if it wasn't for this entire ecosystem that nurtured us and nurtured the evolution of mankind. We couldn't exist without the trees, without the fungus, without the other animals and plants. So you could say that their purpose is, is to facilitate our life, right? And I think if we look at the world like that and look at the connection with that, we can say that you know, our purpose is to facilitate more elevation and to give back. And I think kind of that's kind of what you touch on. It's not all about our own consumption. It's about like kind of what we can give back instead of just consume me, 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 me. It's mm. it's like a, a symbiosis. It's a it's a community. And um, you know, I know I'm really grateful. You said you donate half of the proceeds of your art to. That's correct. Uh, half which? of all the prints and reproductions. So I make clothes and tapestries and jaclays and half of that gets donated. Yeah. And then sometimes I can do like a direct donation of art that gets sold at an auction, and, and that I'll... usually generates a lot of money. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it feels good. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, it's an interesting topic because um, finding a meaning in life is kind of like a subjective thing. Uh, one person might have a different meaning than another does, but I, I agree with a lot of what you, the meaning that you see in life, simply because if we do have that attitude of like cooperating and contributing and being, having that balance in that regard of what we're taking versus what we're contributing, I've found that we tend to be happier and healthier and it just, it feels better to yeah. be like that. I almost, uh, I would even venture to say that we're designed you know, that we, everything is designed to be a functioning part of the whole, yeah. Everything was designed to be a functioning part of the whole. Yeah. I like that. Yeah, and when we, when we lose that balance, we get in trouble, and you can see it in so many ways. They're like, <clears throat> all of the psychological things, like I, I was, I remember watching commercials, you know, and they're like, oh, depression is bad and you need to treat it with this pill. And through the process of my life, I've realized, like, I get depressed when my energy is low because I'm not making responsible energy decisions, yeah. you know, and I've gotten in a low point and I feel like crap and I don't feel motivated. And uh, so I think it's really easy to just... Uh, look at things as like, oh, it's a thing that needs treated with a prod, uh, product versus to see that we all kind of have like this hard wiring of like, that of signals that tell us when we're, you know, in health or not. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that is kind of the mentality. And, and I've, I've suffered from depression and it's, it's taken a while. I do not like traditional prescription medications. I don't like the way they make me feel. I think SSRIs are evil. I know that's a pretty divisive word to use, but um, I felt like a ghost. You know, I didn't feel happy or sad. My libido would just go down. I was like 20 years old when I took those pills, so it's it's um, not something that I would recommend to anyone. But I do know that depression and anxiety seem to be on the rise. Um, I think statistically it's been proven that more and more younger people are more and more depressed and I think it's a symptom of like the neurosis of society and how we're supposed to live and treat treat ourselves with these pills would you say that or to fill ourselves with other forms of of addiction or to fill up these, this void with other forms that can be addictive like television or bad food or alcohol or video games mm -hmm. would you say that you've had depression or have felt that in like some of your life yeah I'm sure that I've had and I would even venture to say that every human has had like the whole 
um, gamut of uh, uncomfortable emotions and psychological experiences uh, like anxiety and depression and all that stuff I think it happens to everybody yeah. it's, uh, it's a natural part of the process of being a human and it sounds like you are the more you're in touch with your needs the more you can sort of address that and, and not be depressed mm. but are there any other practices or are, are there any practices that you take like med meditation or mm. yoga or a healthy diet or lifestyle or the things that work for you mm -hmm. specifically yeah and um, actually as we're speaking I'm thinking I'm wondering maybe there's somebody out there that does need medicine you know like they're they've got an imbalance or something that's like beyond personal home remedies and I don't want to leave them in the dark you know there I'm sure that there are cases where it's appropriate but um, thank you I think generally speaking <laughs> yeah because I could be very uh, opinionated about all that I think yeah, me too. I, I think that's a said good thing to say. Similar comments, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then at the same time, I think that our bodies are, are just well. I know that our bodies are amazing instruments, and uh, I've directly experienced my own ability to heal my body and mind through uh, meditation, fasting, and another thing uh, that's kind of an interesting practice is to kind of. A person can evaluate every choice and every action um, in terms of am I gaining energy or spending energy, you know, and so if, if we eat a really big meal and it bogs us down for a while and we have to take a nap, you know, and we indulge, that's losing energy, right? Even and, though you're eating food, which should be an uptake of energy. Uh-huh. Yeah. And so I found that that simple practice of just being like, okay, is this plus energy or minus energy to make this decision? And that, that can be extended to almost every choice in our life. Um, just keeping, a, keeping an eye on that can be really helpful in kind of becoming aware of the ways that we're accountable for our own like uh, happiness and delight versus like depression, anxiety, and things like that. When did you get in touch with this energy? How are you? How can people be in touch with this energy? Um, I think it just naturally happened through the process of life. That uh, when I was younger, I like did all the rebellious things and had a lot of fun doing that, and kind of learned some hard lessons. And that's what taught me to like, okay, I need to pay attention to the things that make me feel good or don't yeah, feel good. You have a hard lesson that you could share? Uh, oh my goodness, <laughs> plenty. <laughs> Yeah, I um, I had a I've had a lot of uh, drug experiences. I've also had a lot of experience uh, with the flow of sexual energy, uh, the way that it just naturally accumulates and then it can be released. Um, I can't really speak to how that extends to females, but for a male, that's been a very important thing for me to keep an eye on. Yeah, I found that releasing that's, that's sexual energy can can be a very fast way to drain oneself okay uh -huh. and i know my partner hollis um and i have talked about the frequency of of a release as a male and, uh -huh. and like what that means as far as like your psychic or whatever kind of internal energy you want to call it um i do notice in my own self if i have too many releases or force it that um it can feel draining and I've heard a lot about like holding onto your seed as long as possible or, or whatnot but from the flip side I do know that if I do not release I will naturally in my dreams and also maybe so do you think some people have more sexual energy than others and can release more often or need to release more often than others I'm sure they do and the Taoists the Taoists would say that uh, when you're younger you can okay. more often and okay. as you get older it becomes more important to retain Okay. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. And there are other things too, like diet. Whenever I, uh, I've always been exploring diet, had a really intense period of my life where I was treated for cancer and uh, was considering alternative treatments and learned a lot about fasting and diet and had a lot of experience with fasting and diet that attested to everything that I read and so it kind of confirmed a lot of that. And that's been a major part of uh, me realizing my own power to keep keep my own balance and health with the abilities of my own body, like yeah. not even needing external things 
So what does that diet look like to you? Um, so it varies. Uh, there are so many fads and trends and stuff. And then I think it's also common to say for to get excited about the possibility of finding this amazing answer, you know, and kind of tout something as being like a be all end all solution. So um, I've tried all kinds of things and now it's like using them as life varies, you know, and uh, very often I find myself uh, doing a day or two of just pure raw food in a blender, you know, if I'm feeling under the weather or a little behind in sort my of your energy balance. Is guiding you. Yeah. Yeah. And those kind of foods, like eating uh, basic natural foods and uh, raw foods, simple ones. Whole foods. Yeah. That just makes me feel great. That's I awesome. feel awesome. And uh, then I get back, I'm like, okay, I feel good, so now I can eat what I want. And, I, and things can kind of get out of balance. And that's just like a constant thing. There are a lot of indulgences available today. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Um. Would you say that your artwork is a form of meditation for you? Certainly. Um, so that kind of makes me want to offer my definition of meditation. Please. Yeah. There are a lot of meditations available. And um, some of them have this quality of being like, what do you want to get for yourself through this spiritual practice? And... Um, then there's this meditation that was introduced to me, which uh, it's been realized is the deepest and most fundamental meditation, which is simply to be aware of our, our own consciousness, to be in a state of watching the sense, I am. And the reason that is the most fundamental is because all of the other meditations, for example, if someone said like, do this practice and you will get this result, then those are states of consciousness and you know they're made out of consciousness and secondary to consciousness. So watching the consciousness itself is uh, just, it's fun, more fundamental. It's the basis of all the other things we could uh, do in spiritual practice. And so um, that being said, uh, yes, art is a form of meditation not to the degree that I would say put it as a condition on meditation because I can I can be in that state of pure presence or pure being you know without need for any crutch any drug or um, activity or even a practice. it doesn't depend on anything and that that can be a spiritual trap is to to say that our our natural effortless state of being like depends on a practice you know and um, I see that a lot as a spiritual trap is like oh, well, this is my meditation, and it kind of gets glorified or glamorized as meditation, and now um, people are feeling like meditation depends on X, Y, Z, you know, when it doesn't. It's the deepest reality. And um, so um, having said those things, the, uh, yes, art can be likened to meditation in the sense that, like, in that state of creation, after developing a lot of practice and being in a flow state to where it doesn't take too much uh, conscious effort, um, it's uh, it's pretty nice because uh, there's there's this absence of all the mental noise, and uh, there there's the absence of the thought like me I, which is a, honestly the thought that causes the most trouble yeah. in all of us and. Uh, so yeah, there are a lot of things that can kind of be like a meditation, you know, and they have the quality of meditation because they kind of, they silence the mind. What you're saying really resonates with me, and I think um, I too have found there's sort of a trapping with the word meditation or this practice, and it has to be this sort of set thing. Um, I think hearing you, hearing you speak, the word mindfulness hmm. comes up, and it's, it's I, something I like to practice but we can practice mindfulness every second of our life. And, and like you said, being present in this podcast is about persons of presence and it's about being present. And I think like that in and of itself is meditation or mindfulness, but being, being present right now of the consciousness, I really, I really do like that. And as a random tangent back in time to like a little bit more of the conversation, what you said sort of illuminated something inside of me and, and I would like to, to share. Um, you talked about consuming 
energy mm -hmm. and whether it's your diet or whatever it is you ask the question is this giving me energy or is this draining me of energy and you brought the example of eating bad food and how that can be draining and um, obviously good food can can feel invigorating and I, we've all had those moments of of like you know I'm out dancing and someone is dancing super hard and like I'm feeling kind of tired but they're the way they're dancing is is giving me energy again and I can dance hard again even though mm -hmm. I felt tired but now that this like sort of psychic transfer of energy has happened I can sort of dance harder and having been in an intimate relationship um, and living in the van closely with someone else I think um, a lesson I want to pull from that is not only should, I, do I want to be mindful of my energy consumption and what what uh how it's affecting me but i also want to be mindful of the energy i'm putting out and how that's affecting other people and and is the energy that i'm putting out is that giving them energy and lifting them up and making them feel good or is the energy i'm giving out is that draining a person and making them feel negative or 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 bad and, and i've definitely had those experiences with arguments or criticisms i think that can be very draining on someone or there's you know plenty of instances of how we can all drain each other and i just I, i'm grateful that you brought that up because I, I think it's a good thing to think about not only in the context of ourselves but yeah. in the context of of the world around us yeah yeah i really appreciate hearing that response and that reflection of it because uh, i didn't think of it that way you know it's so true that our actions can uplift and bring other people down as well as ourselves and it comes right back to what you were saying with the what is um, elevated consciousness or what is raising the frequency of consciousness and like you said it's about understanding that it's not just in the context of our own personal life um, Paul Stamets said that you know your life is not just your life it's in the context of, of nature right like it's in the context of this interwoven web of everything and I think it's just absolutely beautiful to think about the world like that and it's definitely changed my life to think about the world in that kind of way mm -hmm. I don't know if there's anything else you'd want to touch on. I'm really happy with the way the direction this conversation is, is headed in. Yeah, I'm really enjoying it too. Um, I think I'd like to speak a little bit more about um, choosing to be an artist versus Please. the regular working yeah. life. It's a I feel like I, thing to talk about. Yeah, I kind of got started there and um, I was saying that the... Uh, it's. I don't think it's realistic to give the, the people the instruction of like, quit your day job right now and just do art. And that's just, uh, I feel like that's my own experience and thought processes um, that make me feel that way, that maybe it would be irresponsible to tell people that because not everybody would succeed, you know, and I don't want to have that on my conscience, you know, like putting ideologies out there. And I also think that, you know, because of that energy balance concept, like, I think it's only fair that if we want to have an experience in this existence, if we want to take something from existence, that we should be willing to give something to existence back, you know? And so I think that very often uh, work is kind of um, underrated. Um, I hear a lot of people in spiritual circles talk about manifestation. And there's, it's always, uh, Almost every time I hear it, they're like telling about like this trick to kind of cheat the system and get what you want just by thinking about it, you know. And I don't, I don't ever hear anybody talk enough about work when it comes to manifesting. You know, like if you want to make something happen in your life, there's this totally fair way to do it, which almost everybody can do. You know, it's it's not like unfair in the sense that like, oh, only I have this manifesting power and other people don't. But, you know, anybody who wants to go and work at something can attain, like, fulfill their desires. And um, another thing about work is that it, it makes us strong, you know, like, I think a lot of the reason that um, I wanted and a lot of the people that approach me want to be able to do art exclusively is because it's pleasant, you know. And that's kind of, that can be a troublesome area, you know, like what happens when a kid just gets everything they want? Like they get spoiled and their mind gets rotten. Yeah. And so I think that work has this element of like, you don't want to do it, but in the work environment you're struggling with coworkers, which makes you psychologically strong and you're like, you have to use your body, which makes you physically strong and it's unpleasant, which makes you like... Spiritually strong. Yeah, yeah. 
And so I really, uh, I think work is great. And anybody who wants to uh, kind of start shifting their life in the direction of their creative passion, I would encourage them to, you know, not to make a, any sudden drastic decisions. Like, I don't know the answers and anything can go any which way, you know, maybe there's someone out there that if they did go for it, you know, gung ho, that they would succeed instantly. Or if uh, there's, there is also somebody that if they put everything they could into it, they wouldn't succeed. So it's really, I don't have any absolute truths regarding that, but it's worked for me and it's felt good to like, it's, let's see, it's taken six years for me to make this transition. I knew I wanted to do it six years ago. And since then it's been a gradual transition where I eventually, uh, they were making budget cuts at work and I volunteered. I was like, well, I will take, uh, a reduction in my salary if I can have Fridays off. And so I just kind of started that shift a long time ago. And you know, three days a week is a lot. You know, I, I still I was making enough money to pay off my loans, my student loans, but had m way more time for art. And that opened up Fridays, which made it a lot easier to go out on the weekends and still like have enough time to be creative. And uh, then, eventually like leaving that job like now I still work two or three days a week doing carpentry yeah so that's what I would suggest to anybody that wants to make that kind of change would you say that art is work or that pursuing that creative process is a work yeah the uh, that question makes me uh, think of other questions because uh, anything that we see um, very often it's not that the thing is a certain way it's how we're looking at it. So if we look at art as like, oh shit, I need to get this done. I need to finish this commission for this guy or I need to finish my art to pay the rent. Um, or, oh, I really need to do this to get approval or I care a lot about what other people think and I'm like pushing myself. Then it could feel more like a, uh, that work feeling. And then, um, you know, if it's done out of just like joy or in, uh, playfulness, then it'll feel more like play. And so that's an important topic as an artist because um, back when I was a carpenter, I had this experience of uh, losing love for carpentry in the creative process because uh, at first I was getting paid hourly, but then it switched to piece pay. So I was getting paid based off of what I completed that day. And at the time I had a lot of financial um, pressure. And so I started thinking of like, okay, the door's 65 bucks, the window, casing a window is 35 bucks, and everything got translated into dollars to where I was doing that automatically, and I wasn't looking at it as the way that I used to look at it, which is like, oh, I gotta learn something new and create this stuff and leave it behind me every single day, and it's fun. And it that kind of translated the experience. And that, that was a good lesson that kind of came forward into um, being an artist, which is that um, it's important to keep an eye on like what our intention is approaching a creative process, because that's going to determine uh, how we feel about it and the experience we have and, and the result, you know, like if we're angry or pushing ourselves, you know, or like having really, yeah. really self-conscious about it, it's not going to feel good and it's, yeah. It's, it's going to take us out of that flow state. Mm -hmm. It's going to take us out of that mindful mindfulness that we're trying to cultivate and practice but I think when you talk about work I still think that it is work I think it's not good to think of it necessarily as work while you're doing it but I think like at the end of the day it is labor to be applying a paintbrush and and putting it on the canvas I think that is work mm -hmm. um, it may not be the same as building a building but it kind of is like you're starting with these base materials and then you're adding to it and creating something from nothing and I sort of think about, um, you know, producing videos, which is kind of a passion of mine. And and I think it's work. Like, it's, there's, a, there's a lot of stuff that goes into video editing. And even though I enjoy it for the most part and, and I'm really happy with what comes out, I still think it is work. And I think, I, I think that looking at it as work um, can be beneficial and not just negative. Like, I think it still is something positive for society and we're, we are being productive in a creative way to help help people and inspire people maybe but uh i do enjoy your perspective on that Thanks. i think it is important to not to be mindful of of our mindset while we're doing the work um that's for me the takeaway from what i'm hearing you say
Yeah. And thanks for saying that because it opened my mind up to uh, the merits of regarding it as work. Yeah. Like that it can be something that contributes to society and that we can go get up in the morning and have a sense of duty about it. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. motivation. Because a lot of people have that sense of duty if you're a doctor or something like that. You know, that's work, clearly. Mm -hmm. And it's clearly something that is needed in society to take care of our sick people or if you're people who are in construction or all that. That's work that needs to be done. We do need to build houses and shelter and farming is work. And But that sense of duty, I think, and that's... Our, our society definitely takes pride in that, right? Like, that's that's why we all want to go to school and get a job is because we work and we're contributing and we have this security. And so there is, I think... I think it's good to sort of acknowledge that in the like creative realm too, to that that is work and it is a contribution. And uh, maybe this is a good segue to talk about what like we had this conversation in the car on the way here about is art necessary mm -hmm. and like what what does that mean? And um, I really <laughs> I, I appreciate that you said art is not necessary, mm -hmm. right? And I think that's totally true. Like we don't need art to survive, and yeah. and, and certainly maybe we haven't been producing art and. But there are instances of art going way, way, way back in, in time as mm -hmm. well. Um, and I think, uh, just to sort of touch on what I said in the conversation, I think that it might not be necessary, but I think that it is a step in the evolution and it does like inspire us. I mean, that's why we're having this conversation in the first place, is I was inspired by, by your art and I just wanted to know more about it and how you did it, because it was... The, the, the composition and the end product mesmerized me, but it also raised my curiosity as to how that's possible um and i think that it shows us that it is possible and i think that's a beautiful thing and just to continue and and touch on the point in that conversation i had just like with anything in life once the four minute mile is broken then we can break the four minute mile it took years 10 years to break the four minute mile and people thought it was impossible but then once we saw that it, it was broken it was now possible. And the same as I've noticed with certain athletic endeavors like rock climbing, I can't do a certain route and then I see someone do the route and I can do it in a second once I know it's possible. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's that's the beauty of, of artwork and, 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 and pushing the boundaries of, of human possibilities. Mm -hmm. You just reminded me of a certain experience that I'm very fond of, which is most of the time that we see visual art, we see a finished product, you know, we're on on our phones or social media or at a gallery and we see a painting and uh, we seldom get to see the creative process and I really love that about live painting and how prevalent that's uh, becoming in Colorado these days is that you can see people doing the process and um, it, it adds an element to the experience that um, people might not have even wondered or asked you know like how does that happen you know and seeing it actually take shape it's really great. I've gotten a lot of feedback from people that they just, uh, they love uh, that experience of seeing how it happens. And I love it myself, seeing all, all my friends painting in their processes. Yeah, and it, you reminded me of that when you're talking about climbing a route, you know, it's like um, looking at it, you might not know how to get to the end results, you know, but seeing it happen can kind of take away the, the unknown part of it and make it look a lot more possible yeah yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. well, thank you Derek thanks again for taking the time out of your day to have this conversation I hope um, it certainly helped me it just just in this in this last hour and I hope that uh, other people get something out of it too awesome yeah thanks for inviting me I really appreciate being able to sit here and chat of course yeah